The following program was produced by the Theosophical Society in America. I think this is a really good topic, and I think it's a really important topic that we should address. Uh, having worked for 28 years as a, a Protestant minister myself, and then, having, and then I started an interfaith group in New York City, and so the whole future of the church and uh, inner Christianity or inner esotericism is very important to me. I'd like to start with a little story. There's a little story about uh, four Zen students who decide to go into a week of silent meditation together. And they sit down, and a couple of hours go by, and one of them says, I, I wonder if I remember to turn off the stove. <laughs> to which the second one says, you idiot, you have spoken. We had agreed not to speak. <laughs> to which a third one says, and now what are you thinking about? You too have spoken. <laughs> to which the fourth one says, I'm the only one who's not spoken. <laughs> <laughs> which really, I think, gets us to this idiot, uh, which is uh, the basis of uh, a good deal of what I want to share with you this morning. The idiot is called an ego, <laughs> uh, which bangs around inside our brains and tells us all sorts of foolish things, like that we're not really worthy or that we're really hot stuff <laughs> on the other extreme. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, it distracts us and tells us that all the stuff that's out there in the world is, is really, really important stuff and that we should be making a lot of uh, investments in that, like politics. No. Uh, <laughs> that's on our minds at the moment, right? Or whatever it is that seems to be obsessing us at, at any particular given time. Uh, while there is a, another world, which is what Jesus was trying to tell us about. Every parable in the Gospel of Matthew begins with the phrase, the kingdom of heaven is like... Da, da, da. So he's trying to give us some idea about what the kingdom of heaven is like. And we're still trying to be clear about what the kingdom of heaven is like. I think it's interesting that it says also in the Gospel of uh, Matthew that Jesus uh, always spoke in parables, and that he never spoke without using parables. And we really need these stories because you really can't talk about the beyond. You really can't talk about the divine in words, which I, Christopher did a good job of it a moment ago in terms of talking about it. I think at times he was almost poetic. And uh, when we get to the poetic dimension, I think we're beginning to, to get to it. But mystics are often poets, po poets are often mystics. But one of the most basic characteristics of a mystical experience is it's ineffable, that words just don't work. But words are all we've really got to work with, so we're going to try to work with what we've got to work with here. So let me give you a little outline of what I would like to do this morning. First, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, how I think we got into this mess that we're in. By mess that we're in, I mean the ego's world and all of the immense uh, division that we see around us. And um, what the alternative to that is. And now I want to talk about several aspects on mysticism. I've just written a new book called What is Mysticism? There's a, a copy laying back there as long as I'm... As long as I'm advertising, by the way, I also have a little magazine back there called Miracles. Just pick up a, a free copy, and there's a pad back there if you'd like to sign it. I'll send you a free subscription for the next uh, half a year. And 
After that, if you want to subscribe, great. And if you don't, you just won't get any more. <laughs> <laughs> so for the outline, I want to talk a little bit about how we got into this mess. Then um, I would like to say some things about what I think mysticism is not. And uh, then I'd like to remind you about some mystical experiences you've already had. And then I'd really like to spend about the balance of the time by talking about what a mystical experience is really are all about. Actually, there's two ways of talking about mysticism. Uh, one is to talk about it as an experience, and that's the way we like to talk about it a lot. Right? And the other way to talk about it, which uh, Christopher was relating to, especially there at the end with that last uh, question, was that it's an inner journey process, and that it's an ongoing, so it's not just an experience, but it's an ongoing deepening process. There's a kind of cooking, churning, turning thing that goes on inside us, and I know it's really going on inside you, otherwise you wouldn't be here at an esoteric uh, conference. I'd like to get a little feel for a few things. How many of you would say that you've had a mystical experience? That's what I would think. Almost every hand went up. Uh, two out of three Americans say that they have had a mystical experience, and actually I think it's much closer to three out of three. It's just that a lot of folks don't remember it. How many of you are clergy? Oh, that's what I thought. Uh, how many would you say that you're esoteric clergy as opposed to uh, traditional clergy? How many are traditional? I mean, you, you serve a Methodist, Presbyterian, uh, okay, Episcopal, okay, that kind of a tradition. That's interesting. How many of you are Course in Miracles students? Ah, oh, okay. How many are serious Course in Miracles students? <laughs> I had two hands on that last one. <laughs> Good. Um, I, I'll also say that a lot of wherever I say, I'm going to probably be referring back a good bit to A Course in Miracles. The question came up for Richard last night about the importance of the Course, and frankly, uh, I think The Course in Miracles is the most mystical and, as in some ways, esoteric Christian document, uh, certainly across the face of planet Earth in the 20th century. and, and uh, probably the 21st century. Well, we're in the beginning of the 21st century. We'll see what happens. I think there's some interesting occurrence. Did you know that uh, The Course in Miracles was um, copyrighted in 1975 and printed in 1976? Mary Baker Eddy, Science and Health was copyrighted in 1875 and printed in 1876. It's exactly... And didn't I hear somebody say last night, was Madame Blavatsky 1876 as well? Yeah, I mean, 1875, right, so that's also, that's another little, what's going to happen in 20, 20, 2075, who knows, or 76. Anyhow, I'd like to begin by talking about, a, telling you a story, it's a story, you know this story, you've heard this story many, many times before, and uh, I think uh, Dr. Elwood might be talking about this later this afternoon, just guessing. It's the most basic story there is in the Abrahamic tradition, in Christianity, Judaism, and, and Islam. But it's a really good way to get into looking at what I'm calling a problem here, which is namely the birth of this thing we call an ego, which seems to be such a distraction for us and keeps us from the awareness of the kingdom within. You all know this story. It's the story of Adam and Eve. What I want to do is I want to demythologize this story a little bit. I want to just kind of look at some really basic elements here before we proceed. So there's a, a guy named Adam. Of course, Adam means man. We don't necessarily have somebody named Adam, but the guy named Adam who has some kind of an experience. The way this experience is described in the Bible, it says his eyes were opened and he was able to distinguish between good and evil. Now that's a very important point. So where we had before had a kind of unified state of mind, suddenly we have a divided mind. We have a split mind. We have two possibilities. We have good and evil. By the way, I want to ask you, I just finished reading this book yesterday. Some of you read 
My Stroke of Insight by Jill Bolte Taylor. Do you know about this book? Yeah. She was on Oprah on Thursday, I think. It was already on the bestseller list. I'll just tell you a little bit about this book, which is really kind of confirms what I'm saying right now. Jill Bolte Taylor was a neuroanatomist, neurologist, PhD, Harvard, uh, who had a stroke in her left hemisphere. She woke up one morning realizing that she was having a stroke. Now, here we have a neurologist who's having a stroke, right? <laughs> By the way, she's only 37 years old at this point, so she was one of the youngest, uh, on, young, youngest member of the Neuroscience Academy, right? So she wakes up one morning realizing that she's having a stroke. At the same time, she's having an incredible mystical experience. Her mind is just so expansive. She's looking, she's connected with everything. And she's loving everything. And she's in this deep sense of peace and gratitude even for this experience that she's having. And it's just so beautiful and wonderful. At the same time, she knows she's having a stroke. So she's got to get help. But she can't remember how to dial a phone. Then she just looks down and they're just squiggles, right? And she doesn't even know how to, how to do any of that. She slipped out of her left brain thinking. And she slipped over into this right brain thinking, which is, you know, this kind of creative, intuitive, mystical dimension that's there for all of us. Well, anyhow, she eventually figures out by putting a finger on and looking for that same symbol. She doesn't know what it means and hitting it. Using a card, she's able to call her boss at the hospital, and, and he's able to get her, get her help. But she tells this story in the book, and what she's talking about is there has, she realizes that it's really possible for us to be able to access more of the spiritual dimension I mean, here she was a very rationalistic person. Now, now into this total other way of seeing. And so now her message that she's trying to share with everybody is there are things you can do to get more into the what we would call the esoteric or the mystical dimension. And we don't have to be caught up in just in this left brain thinking all the time. The way the Course in Miracles says, talks about this, it says, the ego analyzes. The Holy Spirit accepts. And I want to use that, by the way, this is the first definition that I will give you this morning of what I will call the difference between a mystic and an ordinary person. And the basic difference is that the ordinary individual is a projector. There's a section in the Course in Miracles, chapter 21, first paragraph, called Projection Makes Perception. Whereas projection makes perception. The world is as you see it, nothing more than that. But no, it's not more than that, it's not less. Therefore, to you, it's important. It's the witness to your state of mind, the outside picture of an inner condition. As a man thinketh, so does he perceive. That line is straight out of Proverbs. Jesus quotes it in the Gospels. Now we find it for a third time here in the Course in Miracles. So the ordinary mind is a projector. We're constantly analyzing, interpreting, evaluating, judging everything that we see. The mystic mind is receptive. So the mystic mind just sees. The mystic mind is just there. It's just present. I mean, look how impressed we've all been by the work of Eckhart Tolle, you know, because he's talking about also the same thing of being able to access this, this other mind, which is there for all of us which the spiritual folks really know something about, a great deal about. But it's not projective. It's not analyzing and interpreting and, and condemning and, and being angry. It's laid back and looking and seeing and just being, just being, just being. I think in a lot of ways that's what a mystic is. A mystic, I think the last line of my book is, uh, mysticism just is. Uh, just is, is being is wonderful. Just, just being. Let me go back to Adam. So there's this guy named Adam who has this experience. This split comes into the mind. I guess we could even argue that there was a time prior to this, prior to Adam, when uh, we were more in the, to the right brain thinking. 
where it wasn't so analytical. I mean, Adam is really the first philosopher. I mean, he's really the first person to raise questions. You know, I, you can sort of imagine the first time man, whatever, looks into his, sees his face in a lake or something and wonders about this, about this thing. So the split comes into the mind. And the first thing that he does after this happens, he runs and he hides in the bushes. That's interesting. <laughs> God goes looking for Adam in the cool of the day. That's what it says in the Bible. Like about 7 o'clock, God takes a walk. He finds Adam hiding in the bushes and says to him, Why are you hiding? Adam never hid from God before. And Adam says, Because I was naked. And the next line from God is a really interesting line. The next line from God is, Who told you you were naked? Where did this idea of naked come from? We'd never been naked before. All of a sudden we got naked. Now how do we get naked? <laughs> so what naked means is he felt the first experience of shame. The first experience of guilt, something has gone wrong. Can you remember as a child, maybe, one of the first experiences of guilt, shame, something went wrong, you hurt somebody, you said something wrong, you lied to your mother. <laughs> right? Something happened. I once asked Ken Wapnick, who's really the leading spokesman for the Course in Miracles, why we thought the Course in Miracles came into existence now. Why did we get this during the latter quarter of the 20th century? He said he didn't know the answer for sure, but there was something he was sure of, is that it couldn't have happened until after Freud. Because it wasn't until Freud that we had a real clear ego psychology. Freud understood the ego very well. Well, the Course also talks about the ego. And it says basically that, that there's two defense mechanisms that we utilize to protect ourselves when we perceive to be threats from the outside world. And Adam perfectly portrays these. The first one is, what's he do? He runs and he hides. The first defense we learn how to utilize as children is called denial. There's really two primary defenses. Works like this. By it works like this, I mean to push away or pull in. The first defense we learn how to utilize is called denial. Freud talked about in terms of repression. It's lying. You know, we learned lying. It's an easy defense. It's a quick defense. Right here on the, you get a little trouble. You got to protect yourself. You just tell a lie. I mean, after all, who's going to know? Of course, somebody knows. You know. <laughs> all right, so now we've got guilt. You, you feel guilty because you separated yourself from this person you just lied to by, by telling the lie. By the way, besides yourself, who do you think the first person you lied to was? The first person you lied to was? Besides yourself. <laughs> Your mother, yes. <laughs> happened a little bit like this. Mother walked into the room and said, what happened here? And you said? Look at that. You remember. The guilt of that moment has stayed with you all these years. I don't know. It wasn't me. I think the dog did that. It wasn't me. All right. So that's denial. That's repression. That's hiding. It's lying. And by the way, I'm not going to go into it at this point, but you, know, you want to really live your life as open and as honest and you know, as free of that as you possibly can because it just makes you feel awful. Animals don't have this. Animals are free of this, which is one of the reasons we love them so much, because they're just there in their immediacy, their presence. We have a cat named Pockets, and he's getting to be old, but a few years ago when he was still a younger cat, one summer I counted, he deposited at our sliding glass door onto the deck 40 dead chipmunks. Pockets has no sense of guilt about this at all. <laughs> Absolutely none. Zero guilt, right? Pockets is a chipmunk killer. <laughs> and one baby squirrel <laughs> and a bird. <laughs> but he's got no guilt about it at all. But all of a sudden, something happens with Adam and he feels guilty. So he goes and he, and he tries to hide it. Of course, you can't really hide from God, right? So God presses Adam to tell him a little bit more about what happened, and Adam says, well, Eve, what other choice did he have? <laughs> or not only just Eve, but the woman you gave me. <laughs> Blame it on God now, right? 
gave me this fruit, and I did eat thereof. So now we know women are responsible for this mess. I've been paying the price ever since, right? So God goes to Eve and says, Eve, what happened? And Eve immediately goes to the second line projection, which, is, which I've already started talking about, which is called projection. We either deny or project, projection. And she says, well, the serpent did beguile me, did trick me, right? And I did eat thereof. As you know, the serpent didn't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> um, oh, I know, no. That was bad, I'm sorry. All right. I'll try to do better. <clears throat> so that's how this whole mess gets started. And depending on how you'd like to view historical time, for the past tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years or more, several billion of us have been trying to do exactly the same thing that Adam and Eve tried to do, which namely is to think a thought outside of the mind of God. And the truth is, you can't do it. But trying to do it is the thing which has given rise to this whole world and all the craziness that's within it. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to get home again, back to heaven again. You know, as you study the, the hero myths and the hero journeys, they're always, any of you read Pilgrim's Progress with John Bunyan's Pilgrim Progress? He's going to the celestial city. Guess what the celestial city is? You know, heaven, right? You've got to get back home again. So we're trying to get back home again, but we're doing it by, not through the externals of it, but through the internal process, the inner journey of discovering what the truth is inside each one of us. And mystics are people who, for one reason or another, either trip into this, I mean, kind of, we, we kind of have these experiences that I'm going to later explain four basic ways in which I think people have come to have mystical experiences. Actually, there's more than four, but I'm just going to talk about four basic ways. And one of those four is that it just seems to happen. I mean, there's like no seeming preparation for it. But they're usually, if you, if you look and you study the situation, you'll see that there was a, a preface to it, even though it's not clear what the preface was for you right there. So Let me start by talking about some things that mysticism is not. Let's clear that. Uh, first of all, it's not a mystery. Uh, sometimes, oh, that's very mystical. Like, you know, that's very not comprehensible. I don't, that's not, like, that's not understandable. Now, there is a link between the word mystery and mysticism. But actually, a mystical experience is, to the mystic at least, is quite clear. It, one of the characteristics of a mystical experience, there are several. Several different people have studied what the basic characteristics of a mystical experience are. And I took all these lists, and I put them down, and I looked at them. I looked at what was similar on all the, all the lists. And one characteristic that's true on almost all lists is what's called a noetic quality, which means that you come to know something. You have revelation, insight, knowledge you now understand at a deeper level some kind of truth about yourself, that you're eternal, that you're a child of God, that love is all you are, something like that, that becomes revelation to you, that there's no such thing as death. So, to the mystic at least, this is not mysterious at all. It's quite a revelation. Of course in Miracles begins chapter 1, section 2, time, revelation, and miracles. So a lot of this is about revelation, awakening. Really the first step on the, most, on the, the mystic journey involves some kind of an awakening, some kind of a, a revelatory, something that calls you, the call to become more, to take this serious, to go deeper into this. And the next step, by the way, a lot of the mystics have come up with steps and stages, and I did that too. I took all the steps and stages, whether it was Sufism or uh, Teresa of Avila or uh, Bernadette Roberts or you know whoever, and came up with lists of steps and compared the steps. And it's very interesting to do that because once you do that, you start realizing, well, there's look that that appears on every step, and what's almost every step, right near the beginning, usually number two, 
The first usually is wakening of some sort. And then number two is purgation. What purgation means is purifying. Some kind of cleansing, some kind of letting go. Maybe letting go of the old church, the old way of doing things. You may actually make a change in your life, let go of a relationship, let go of a job, let go of the pursuit of money, let go of whatever it was that seemed to be there. That Sometimes it's a literal physical purification. Fasting has often been used by mystics as a way to get into the mystical experience. I can pretty well guarantee you that you could have a mystical experience very clearly and probably a pretty profound one sometime within the next month or so, and I can tell you how to do it. Just don't eat. <laughs> Jesus has 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness, right, of fasting. That's a very important that that prefaces his ministry. In fact, as there's no ministry until after the 40 days and the 40 nights. And in the Bible it says after that, meaning after the wilderness event, after that he began to teach, saying. And it's interesting what the first word we have that he said was, recorded in the Bible at least, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent means there's another way of seeing things. Look, look, there's another way of, of looking. There's another way of doing things, right? Because the kingdom has its hand. It's right here. It's literally at hand. It's immediately available if you just can see it, right? So purgation is right there in the very beginning of most of these stages. So, anyhow. Mysticism is not a mystery. The word mysticism actually comes from the Eleusinian mystery tradition, where the mysti was the person who was about to be initiated into the Eleusinian mystery tradition. This is a tradition that went over for, on for 1,400 years, uh, going way, way, way back, around 1,000 or so BC, up to maybe as late as, uh, well, into the maybe three or 400 AD, maybe. And I don't want to go into this, but by the way, Albert Hoffman, the first person to synthesize LSD, uh, wrote a book called The Road to Elysius, in which he showed that as a part of the Eleusinian mystery traditions, th they had to take a drink to, before they were about to go into this initiation process, and the drink was something that was uh, dissolved in a parasite of ergot of rye, which has exactly the same configuration as LSD. So these folks were taking this drink before they would go into this initiation ceremony. And one of the things that happened with psychedelics, by the way, back in the 60s and the 70s, remember? I, yeah, there's some old hippies here, I can see it. <laughs> Was that this experience happened, which showed a lot of people that, that put them into the right brain that moved out of the left brain thinking and into the right brain and showed this that there was another way of seeing things, which didn't have anything to do with this rationalistic way of doing things, but there was a more creative and enjoyable in that, that sense, kind of really opened the mind to all these other possibilities. I'm going to share with you later, well, it's in my book, I can't go through all of them here. There are 21 different ways in which, this, according to this one study, people have come to have mystical experiences. And number 20 is with psychedelics. It's not number one or two or three. It's very low on the list, but it's, it's on the list. So the misty was a person, the misty meant somebody had a veil over them. So the veil was going to be lifted. So there's going to be a lifting of the veil so that you would see more clearly after this experience, right? It's not a mystery. It's not magic. The best book that was ever written on mysticism, I think, and I'd be interested to see if anybody else has any other opinions. I know that there are a lot of scholars here, which is wonderful. Is Evelyn Underhill's book, Simply Titled Mysticism, of 1911, almost 100 years ago. You can still go to Barnes & Noble's today and find it on the shelf and buy it. Any book that is still on the shelf 100 years after it was written is what we call a classic. This is a classic in this field. In there, she says at one point, magic wants to get. Mysticism wants to give. Now, that's a very big difference. 
See, magic is about manipulation of the world. Somehow or another, we're going to change things externally to us. Even prayer in that sense of, you know, God heal my body is a kind of magic. And it's not necessarily that it will be done. But it's saying, I want these external events to change. We're going to change the outside there. Somehow, that's what magic tries to do. It tries to manipulate the universe in one way or another. It's trying to get something. But mysticism wants to give. And the reason the mysticism wants to give rather than to get is because once the heart is opened, and once this expansive sense of presence is there, it's just really natural that all you want to do is give. <laughs> I mean, you want to give your love away. And you want to give your love away to whomever you can give it to. I mean, to whatever you can give it to. And you're ready to fall in love. I'm not talking about another person, although that's wonderful, but music, piece of poetry, something that you've read, an idea, nature, you know, some experience. Mysticism wants to give. It's just, it's just ready to give. And it wants ready to give because it's not, it's not selfish. It's not interested in anything for itself. It understands that as it gives, so does it receive, as a matter of fact. It's the way, that's the way Jesus said it. So it doesn't have anything necessarily to do with the paranormal or the occult. Um, mysticism isn't about uh, reading other people's minds, or looking at auras, or doing anything like that. Now, I might add that as one begins to develop a mystical life, it's quite natural that those things will just begin to happen naturally. I mean, that you would just, for example, very naturally find that you're more increasingly intuitive, that you have greater levels of, of feelings and intuitions and senses about things that you see things, you know things in that sense, that not necessarily that you're going to talk about, but you, you will find this kind of clear, you know that are, things are coming. <laughs> so you begin to be expect, expe, expecting them to be coming because they are coming. So you develop na intuition very naturally, but you don't do it because you want to develop your intuition. It's because you, it's just a byproduct of development of a mystical way of seeing, a mystical way of being in the world. There's no organization for mystics. Uh, there's no club. Uh, there's no society. There are no laws. There are no creeds. There are no rules. There are no regulations. Uh, you don't have to pay fees or make donations on Sunday. <laughs> There are no requirements at all. Mysticism is totally free and totally open. And the way that you become a mystic is by realizing that you are one. <laughs> it's just something that happens inside you. It's just something that happens when you, you see that this is the way I'm. I'm seeing the world in a totally different way than I used to see the world. I'm no longer looking at it strictly from the framework of the ego. Now, I'm not saying that you're necessarily free of the ego. I mean, to be free of the ego would be quite an accomplishment. We would think of that in terms of what we call enlightenment, but I don't think I know too many enlightened folks. Do you? I mean, really, in that sense of, of maybe one or two. And that's... Have you read Jed McKenna's stuff? Well, he says there may be, that there's one in a hundred million. I mean, really enlightened beings on the planet. I don't know, just a, just a guess, maybe. But there's not a lot. But we can be on the way there, and you can be pretty well on the way if you do the practice. Whatever the practice is, I don't care what your practice is, it's just, it's helpful to have a practice. I think it's very important to have a spiritual discipline of some sort in your life. And it can be any discipline. Just having the discipline, though, is very, very important. So, those are some of the things that's not. Now let me remind you about some mystical experiences that you've already had. The first mystical experience that you've already had, you probably can't remember. And the reason you can't remember it is because, <clears throat> excuse me, it was when you were an infant. Infants come from the infinite. 
The word infant and infinite share the same root. The, the N of both means not. Infinite obviously means not finite, not delimited to the form, right? So it's infinite. The N of infant means, comes from infari, which means not yet able to speak, has not yet developed language. See, in this, <clears throat> if you don't have a language, if you don't have the words, then you're just kind of there. And immediacy. You're, you're present, which is again the state that we want to get back to, the state of receptivity. And it can also be argued that before Adam, or you know, way back, I don't know, before Adam, but before, not before Adam, but before writing, before words, before language in the sense of something that's put down in print, before reading and writing, that we were much more right-brained. And we became, since the development of writing, we've become much more analytical and mathematical, etc. We've gone more and more and more into that, that direction with our minds, which is all more reason why we need to kind of real get back to the other way of seeing again. So the infant's just there. You know how you can take an infant and look in their eyes and look right in their eyes and they won't look away? Isn't that great? I mean, they'll just, stay, they'll just stay right with you. How come you can do that with an infant, but you can't do it with some adults? The infant's got nothing to hide. They've got no past. If you've got no past, you've got no guilt. Right? And we talk about the, the eyes being the windows to the soul, right? And some people are afraid while well, he looks at my eye, well, he can't, oh, I can't, you know, I don't want him to look at it. Mm. <laughs> this is a complete aside. I once got rid of an unruly church board member once. It was a real control it kind of a guy. After a really uproarious board meeting one night, I went over to his house the next day and I said, can we just sit on the couch and look each other directly in the eye? Can we just, can we just look each other in the eye? I just don't even talk. We'll just look each other in the eye, all right? He tried, he couldn't do it. He tried, he couldn't do it. He tried, he couldn't do it. Quit the church. And the members of the church says, what'd you do? We're free of this tyrant. What'd you do? I said, didn't say a word. <laughs> he was going to rule as he was going to. He was a real fundamentalist. He was going to make everything come around his way. Well, anyhow, that's a complete aside. So the infant is just there in this immediacy. And they don't have any guilt. They'll pee on you. <laughs> I was watching America's Funniest Videos one evening, and uh, there's the, a guy, there was a father, had an infant sitting on his shoulders, a young child. And here, here's the feet here. And the baby's got a hold of the daddy's head like this, right? And the, the baby's head's up here. And all of a sudden, the baby goes. <laughs> And the infant's going, <laughs> nothing happened, right? <laughs> so what we have here is innocence. Uh, the Course once says, we, what we have to do, we have to get back to innocence. You know, b back to seeing innocence in everything. And you see innocence in everything when you're non-judgmental. But, you know, with the judgmental mind, with the, you know, the analytical mind, you know, we're judgmental about it, so we can't just let it be what it is. I think one of my favorite lines in the Course, one I quote the most is, let him be what he is. Seek not to make of love an enemy. Let her be who she is. Let, it, let the situation be what it is. It's one of the hardest things for us to do. One of the hardest things to do because we think we've got to get in there and fix it. Well, you don't have to get in there and fix it. You need to love it. <laughs> it's a very different thing than trying to fix it, to, just to love it. And that's one of the, the most difficult things I think happens in raising kids, as you all know, who raise kids. Is they don't want us to fix them. They want us to love them. And that's the only thing that they really need. From them. They really need to know that you really love them. If they know that you really love them, they'll come around the right way. Right? On their own. So, the infant is a time of, of being in the infinite, and therefore also in something of a mystical state. Maybe you can remember just the head being laid down on. So there's no worries, there's no concerns, there's no anxieties, nothing bothers you, you know, except 
what, next, some more milk or something. But then we get words. And as we begin to get words, we begin to get a hold on the world. And there's a certain sense in which when we get these words, there's a bit of a curse. By that I mean, like, see, once you know that the name of this object here is a podium, it's now in the case that you will never, ever, ever, never, ever, ever again in your life be able to look at an object that looks like this and not think podium. You don't think that you think that, but you think that. I mean, we all do. We label everything. But then that separates and that begins to divide. And the real problem is, is when we start getting into good and bad and pretty and ugly and nice and not nice. In other words, when judgment comes into the mind. Now we're in trouble. Now we're in trouble with all the judgments of because nobody likes to have judgments thrown at them, right? Okay, so the, in, the infant is in this kind of mystical state. Early childhood, too, is still a very mystical time. Maybe you can remember some part of this here. Up until around seven, eight, nine years old. That, that early phase, Santa Claus is real, fairies are real. Angels are real. It's not, you don't have to question whether they're angels or not. Angels are, that's perfectly possible that there's angels, right? Cartoon characters are real, right? There's a whole world of the ants down there that going on. The, the, the vision is not clear. I had a black cloth doll when I was a kid named Joe, named after Joe Lewis, the boxer, and these big muscles, you know, like Joe Lewis. And I thought Joe was alive. I thought Joe had a soul. And I had a very unfortunate epiphany at the age of nine. I was embarrassed uh, about it. I was uh, sitting on a, a toy box up in my room looking out the window of my father working in the field. I grew up on a farm in Missouri. And looking at Joe and thinking, he's not really alive. You know, he doesn't really have a soul. You know, I'm going to have to put him up. I have to stop. I can't just, I can't, this is, I'm nine years old already. You can't keep playing with a doll. You know, your boy. <laughs> so my dad came in from work, or for lunch that day. I remember telling him I'd like to go out in the field with him that afternoon. He said, oh, you could, I could come around and ride on the tractor. And so I went out and rode on the tractor with him. And mom put Joe in the cedar chest. And then when I was 45, she gave it back to me as a Christmas present. <laughs> <clears throat> and he sits next to my computer now, and every once in a while I'll turn and look at him and say, what do you think about that, Joe? <laughs> so Joe's still alive, you know, but you understand what I'm saying. You know, imaginary friends are real. I mean, there's this whole dimension there. So it's still, a, you know, we, we grow up and we learn. You, like the song from South Pacific, you've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught to hate and fear. You got So we're very carefully taught by our families and the church and the school and you know, uh, Rajneesh at one point said, everyone's born a mystic. And then we take them to the school and to the church. <laughs> you know, and then we, then we get the education and then the world becomes important and then other kids and status and all that stuff that we start going for in the world, that becomes important and we start forgetting about those other times. Right? Probably the first mystical experience that you had, which you can remember, and by the way, anytime you have this experience, it's a mystical experience, but especially the first time. It was the first time you fell in love. There's a lot of the qualities of a mystical experience in falling in love. You're not in control. That's one of the basic characteristics of a mystical experience, by the way. You, you're not in control. Because the ego is in control. I mean, you know, but you're not in control. This is happening to you and through you, this wonderful, it's a feeling. It's just a feeling, but it's inside you, and, and you're high, and you're light, and you're giddy, and you kind of, the feet really don't quite touch the ground, and you're smiling all the time, and not only that, it's happening to this other person too, you know, and, and you're looking at this person, and you just, you see them as, as perfect. I remember when I first fell in love with my high school sweetheart, I remember looking at her and thinking, that she could do no wrong, that she wouldn't even have known how. That's what I mean by innocence, you see. That's what the Course says, you need to be able to, to see the innocence. You need to look past the mask, 
past the junk, past all that surface stuff. The, you know the, who Jesus is in terms of the Course in Miracles. I love the definition of Jesus in the Course in Miracles. It says, Jesus was a man who saw the face of Christ in all of his brothers and sisters and remembered God. Isn't that an interesting definition? Jesus was a man who saw the face of Christ in all of his brothers and sisters and remembered God. So, and we've got this job, you know, to, to see the face of Christ in everyone you see and, and see God. <laughs> and see Christ in there. That's the, that's that's really reaching. So, and the same thing wonderfully happened when I first fell in love with my wife too. I remember looking at her, and, and I still look at her this way. I still think of her as, as innocent and pure. My wife said to me this last Valentine's Day. She said, uh, "Honey, you know you don't write me poetry anymore." <laughs> and I thought, "Oh my God, she's right. I don't." <laughs> But there was something about that first year when I was falling in love with her, right? I was just like, I was like, I was like Hallmark on steroids. <laughs> it was just flowing out, you know, it was just pouring out. Wrote a whole book of poetry that first year, you know. How come when the heart's in, you know, when you're falling in love, you can write poetry? And other times you can't write poetry, right? Keep in mind the mystics are often poets, the poets are often mystics. There's a because they see something, that, and then they share it with us, like Robert's poem that shared. Right? That, that, you know, there's, there's a seeing in there that we can all identify with somehow or another. But you also know what happens. Psychologists tell us this romantic phase, it actually has a time limit on it. It's somewhere between three and 18 months. Now, if you can manage not to get engaged during this time, no, I just mean. <laughs> Most folks do. My parents were married within six months after they met. Mom says on the third date already was asking her, right? <laughs> and you're in love. Right? But then what happens is, you know, that one day you're looking at your beloved and you go, you know, that, that, that cute, oh my God, that, that cute dimple, that's a pimple. <laughs> Where the hell that pimple? This guy drinks every day. Oh my God, he's an alcoholic. I've got a ring on my finger. How did this happen? <laughs> I mean, we sober. Um, Plato called uh, love divine madness. <laughs> love is blind, right? Well, in that sense, we do want to be blind. But, but falling in love, there's a lot of qualities of the mystical experience in falling in love. It's bigger than you are. You give yourself to the experience. You give yourself to the mystical experience experience as well. And it carries you. You have to be carried like an infant is carried through the experience. If you try to direct it, that's why with the psychedelics again, when people had bad trips, as long as they kept just letting go and just going with it, it was a beatific trip. But if, they, if the ego got, oh my God, what's happening? And they started getting a little scared about, oh, 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 you know, what's that noise? Somebody coming in the door, you know, and then, then it became a bad trip because then when the you kind of tried to control it. If you try to control it, it didn't work. So, then there are a lot of what I have a little section in my book I call mini mystical experiences. M I N I, mini mystics, mystical experiences. This is not a full blown mystical experience. This is not a revelatory kind of experience necessary or life changing kind of experience. And I'm sure that everyone here has had a lot of <coughs> minis. Minis would include things like uh, an insight. A real clarity when then, you know, aha, there's an, a certain epiphany quality about mystical experiences. Aha, I see. Oh, yeah, this is clear to me now. But, you know, if you have a mystical, I mean, if you have an epiphany or you have an insight, you, you would turn to somebody and you turn and you tell them their insight and they'll look at you and they'll go, so? <laughs> <laughs> it's your insight. <laughs> you know, they probably got two thoughts. One is they've already had that insight, so they, well, you just figured that out. <laughs> Or number two, they're not ready for it yet. This is one of the reasons that preaching doesn't work. <laughs> I once gave a sermon called Why Preaching Doesn't Work, and it was one of the, nobody liked that sermon. <laughs> well, it's about how we don't change our minds, you know, if, if, let alone the preacher changing his mind. <laughs> But as A Course in Miracles says, if you want to learn it, you've got to teach it. So we teach in order to learn. So that's what us ministers are doing. We're 
teaching this stuff so that we can learn this stuff ourselves and make it real inside us as, as well as share it with uh, the folks that we're sharing it with. So insights, intuitions as well, uh, where you get just this amazing clarity about something, for example. Uh, the difference between insight and intuition is insight's a head affair, and intuition is a heart-gut kind of thing. It's another way of relating to the, to the world. There's a story that's told about Carl Jung, the famous psychologist, who in 1924 came to the United States. He was uh, interested in studying mythology and religion and everything that would give us an insight into the collective unconscious of mankind. And he was out in the Southwest talking to an old Indian, and the Indian said that he thought white men were crazy. And Young said, uh, well, why do you think white men are crazy? And the Indian said, well, he didn't know, but uh, he had heard that they think with their heads. <laughs> and Young said, you mean you don't think with your head? He said, no, Indian think with his heart. This is a very different relationship with the world. If you think that you think from here, I told my mother that story many years ago, and she said, well, I think with my heart. And having known her, I was like, oh, that's right. <laughs> you do. You know, she wasn't intellectual. She was, this is where she related to the world from here. Actually, I think in terms of reading Jill Bolton Taylor's book, uh, A Stroke of Insight, it's not so much the heart as it is really being into moving out of so much left brain thinking into the right brain thinking. We call it the heart, but the heart, and that's a symbol and it's really more that we move into the kind of the right mind thinking instead of the left mind thinking, which is this more loving way of being in the world than it is the rationalistic way of being in the world. So dreams too, I think dreams are very, very important. I think it's really important that we should be studying our dreams because what dreams do is they tell you that there's this much bigger world out there. There's a much, much, much bigger world. And you really should be looking at the dreams because, and if you don't do this already, <clears throat> I really highly recommend, all I can do is make suggestions, that you do work your life out so that you don't have to just jump up in the morning, that you can, you know, if you've got to go to bed earlier, you know, have that, have a real time in there, 15 minutes to even half an hour so you can look at that. So these are just what I call many, these are just little places of, this is not what I call again, these are not full mystical experiences. So, let me start to tell you about the full-blown mystical experiences. There's a guy named Sir Alistair Hardy, who was professor of zoology, actually, at Oxford University, whose main study was life in the sea. This avocation was studying mysticism. And a number of years ago, about 25, 30 years ago, he put an ad in a paper in London and he said, I'm studying mystical experiences. If you've ever had a mystical experience, would you please write it down, send it in, I'm collecting descriptions of mystical experiences. Now, by the way, that work continues to this day by a fellow named David Hay at the University of Wales. You can go online at the Religious Experience Research Institute. Look, Religious Experience Research Institute. And if you've had a mystical experience, you can go on there and you click Mystical Experiences, and you can type up your experience. And then this experience will be added to the database of, of descriptions of mystical experiences. So now what we've come up with is we have 21 basic stimulants for our mystical experience. We don't have time to go through all 21, but I want to go through the first three or four with you, and I'll just kind of lightly mention what some of the others are without going into them. So the number one producer of a mystical experience is probably not what you would think. But before I say this, I want to say something else, and it is that I have noticed that in order to have a mystical experience, there is something which has to happen first. 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 You must stop thinking. <laughs> now, obviously, we just don't stop thinking. Unless something causes you to stop thinking. Actually, Christopher alluded to some of these things in his talk. 
So the number one producer of mystical experience, by far the biggest category, much bigger than the others, like 60%, is despair and depression. Now, obviously, despair and depression is not a mystical experience. But it's what happens when you let this experience take you all the way down to the bottom of the bottom of the bottom of the pit. So a better word than despair and depression here would be crash and burn. You hit bottom. You give up. You say, I don't know what works. Everything I tried didn't work. Material well-being doesn't work. Fame, fortune doesn't work. Let me just take an aside here for a moment. I read a study that was done, I think it was in Time Magazine too long ago, about what different generations want. Do you know what teenagers want more than anything else? They want to be famous. The biggest guy, want to be famous someday. When you get to the 20-year-old categories, it's still a pretty big number, but it's smaller than the teens, but it's still pretty, and then when you get to the 30s, it's still fair, but by the 40s, it's starting, by 50s, it's pretty well, by 60s, it's almost totally, you know, 70s, it's gone, right? <laughs> I'm gonna be famous. One thing that you would not like to be is famous. Famous people have very difficult lives. Uh, in uh, some of you read David Hawkins' uh, stuff, and one of his books, I think it's The Eye of the Eye, he says, uh, you know, once the novelty of fame is worn off, it's usually found to be burdensome for people. What you need to get to is this place, there's got to be a, a, the surrendering, the, the relinquishment of the ego's needs to assert itself in this kind of a way. This is a part of the giving up thing. There was a poet who lived near here, where we are right now, uh, Amherst, who I'm so many of you know, Emily Dickinson, right? You know her poem, I'm Nobody? I'm Nobody. Who are you? Are you Nobody too? Then there's a pair of us, don't tell. How boring to be somebody. How public like a frog to say your name the whole day long to some admiring bog. <laughs> the point is that the more you're somebody, the more difficulty you may have in being you. I'm going to give you share a couple of quotes from a couple of other mystics. Uh, Angelus Silesius, 1624-1677, Germany, physician. I think this, this quote should be on the wall in our churches. God whose love is everywhere can't come to visit unless you're not there. <laughs> Think about that. God, whose love is everywhere, can't come to visit unless you're not there. We're so there. We're so in our heads. We're so talking to ourselves all the time. so much chatter going on that you can't be receptive. You can't hear. The analogy I like to use, it's like uh, we're all two-way radios. We can both broadcast and receive. And the problem with most of us is that we've got our tuner set on WEGO. And WEGO is coming in loud and strong and a lot of little static that's going on in the background. Not exactly clear, but definitely dominant. The dominant voice. And what the Course in Miracles is saying, what mysticism is saying, is there's another program being played. And you could listen to this other program. We'll call this WGOD. Now, what the Course says is, it doesn't use this analogy. I'm making this up, but it's still the same principle. You don't turn on WGOD because you don't know how to turn on WGOD. So what you have to learn how to do is turn down the volume on WEGO. As you begin to turn down the volume on WEGO, you begin to become aware of the fact, oh, wait a minute, there's another. Oh, this is very, this is beautiful. Why? This is, this is heavenly. This is beautific. Why? This is very peaceful. Oh, I feel very comfortable listening to this. 
And that's what it's trying to do. But make the switch again. It's making the switch to the left, to the right, to this other way of seeing and being. And then we realize, start realizing that, oh, my church, the last one I served, I retired at the end of 2002, as uh, Richard said, was uh, directly across the street from Carnegie Hall in another theater called Camming Hall. And I would sometimes go, and I would get there early, and I would go to a little coffee shop on the corner and look over my notes and things for the morning. And one day I'm there, and there's a, it's a U-shaped counter, and there's a homeless guy sitting directly across from me with a cup of coffee in front of him. You can tell homeless folks in New York City. He's talking to himself. Right? You know how homeless folks talk to themselves sometimes? I thought, you know, if I get really quiet and I kind of lean in, I think maybe I could hear what he says. And I couldn't make it all out, but I got the gist of it. And what he was doing was he was practicing a speech. And this is like a speech he was going to give to, I couldn't decide who the speech was for. It was like for a brother or a judge or somebody. But what he was doing was he was defending himself. He was building a case for himself. Did you ever do that, driving around in your car? Building a case for yourself? <laughs> Telling somebody what you're going to tell them and you got in front of them? You know, you're getting the words right? right? See, most of us just keep it in our heads. But with a, some homeless folks, it, comes all the way, it gets all the way down into the tongue. It gets all the way down and they start talking, they say it out loud. Projection makes perception. And the world is as we see it as we make it, right? And so this is the way he was making up the world. It's not that the way it is, it's just that that was his making up about this particular event that was going on in his life, whatever that event was, right? Well, anyhow, I just was talking about some of the things that we go for in this world, and one of the things you don't want to, I mean, I'm not, nothing wrong with being famous, <laughs> but if that's the goal, if that's the idea, Marilyn Monroe, you didn't think you'd be hearing about Marilyn Monroe this morning. <laughs> Two months before she died, did an interview with Life magazine. It was tape recorded. I heard it one evening on television, and then after that I went out and eventually found this a transcription in a book called Coffee with Marilyn, or at least part of it. And what she says there is that she doesn't know who Marilyn Monroe is. She says it's like this kind of cartoon character that Hollywood made up sort of a cardboard kind of a thing. She says, but it's not real. And she's crying. She's crying when she says this. It's not me. And then she says, regarding Hollywood making this up, she says, and I let him do it. I went along with it. But I'm just Norma Jean. She says, I'm no sex goddess. A sex goddess is a thing. And I'm not a thing. I'm a person. If you hear she's crying. And two months later, she was dead. Right? So anyhow, I got off on that by talking about fame, fortune. <laughs> that may not be the kind of thing. That, that takes us so far afield. You get so caught up in the drama. You know what Caesar Augustus' last words? Caesar Augustus is the last, I mean, the, the first real Caesar, right? His last words were, did I play my part well in this tragedy? He knew it was a tragedy. And if you know life's story, it was a tragedy. I mean, his wife, Livia, killed all of his children from his first wife so that none of them could become Caesar, so that her son, Tiberius, could become Caesar, which is what happened. And historians think that she even killed Caesar by poisoning figs. He got so he wouldn't even eat the figs. He would, he would only eat figs off the tree. But they think she got him in the ones on the tree. <laughs> all right, back to number one. Crash and burn. Whatever produces a crash and burn experience for you. Fame, fortune doesn't work. Drugs, alcohol don't work. Material well-being doesn't work. Any kind of ego and grandizing, being chairman of the board, doesn't work. <laughs> you know, none of that stuff works. And then there'll be a crash. And you hit down at the bottom of the pit. And then there's this very important thing which has to happen here. You have to give up. You got to surrender. You got to say, I don't know what works. 
And then you have to say a very sincere one word prayer. And that word is? Help. Yeah, help! <laughs> and you gotta mean it, you gotta mean, I need help! Now there's a very interesting thing that happens at this point, I've noticed. Time after time after, what happens at that point is that people get help. And very frequently at that point, and I'll bet you some of you here can testify to this, you'll hear a message. Something will be said to you. After I wrote uh, this book, Listening to Your Inner Guide, several years ago, I ran around leading workshops called Listening to Your Inner Guide. And when I have people tell me about experiences that they've had where they felt as though they had actually received some kind of divine guidance, where they actually heard words, not just an, you know, just not an intuition, but actually heard something. And I would write down what people told me that they heard, and I would, on a little notebook, and then I would go into my office on Monday and I would type down all these things people told me that they heard, and I got well over 200 things listed and then I went through and I started categorizing them, usually by like, what, what was the first word? I was often the first word, or you were off, was often the first word. And then I'm looking at this entire list of more than 200 things that people had told me that they heard, and I realized there was something very common about all of them. It was always something that was very comforting and reassuring. It was never anything that would upset you or disturb you in any way. It was always something like, haven't I always taken care of you? You are my beloved daughter, and I'm, whom I'm well pleased. You've done nothing wrong. I'm here to help you. I just did help you. Heard by a man who was walking out the front door of an office building where he had just been fired. <laughs> you just got help. <laughs> you just became liberated from this unhappy situation that you are in, right? So now you can go out there and find something happier for yourself. The identification of the Holy Spirit in both the Gospels and in the Course in Miracles, synonyms are comforter, guide, healer, teacher, mediator, right? The mediator the, between us and God. And it's often identified as the comfort of the healer, the teacher, right? And that's what this, that's the message, is, you'll, 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 messages vary a lot. Sharon told me a message she heard last night, right? All right, so number one is crash and burn. Don't do crash. You want to have a mystical experience? Don't do crash and burn. Unless, of course, you've already done it. And a lot of people have already done it. And hopefully, if you're really smart, you'll only do it once. Some people, it seems to have to do it two or three times. You know, I mean, you wake up. One of Rumi's poems goes, don't go back to sleep. Don't go back to sleep. Don't go back to sleep. You, know, you, you wake up, but then now you've got to stay awake. And that's where spiritual practice or spiritual discipline would come in really handy now to not go back to sleep. Because the, the, the seduction to go back you know, to the old way to, you know, drinking again or overeating again or whatever it is will be very, very strong. Right? But don't go back to sleep. Number one, crash and burn. Don't do crash and burn. Number two, the second most prominent way in which people have come to have mystical experiences is through meditation. What's the purpose of meditation? I know we got some meditators here. What's the purpose of meditation? Stop thinking. If you can't stop thinking, you at least get into neutral. <laughs> You know, at least kind of get it to the point where it's not spinning off in all kinds of different directions, but where you can kind of relax a little bit and just sort of be present, right? But it's to stop, stop the thinking process. But it's the same idea, to get into this more relaxed, more receptive, to become receptive rather than, uh, rather than being projective again. Because as long as you're being projective, you can't hear. So you need to become receptive in order to hear. And this is a very good, and I'm not going to go into, there are people that can tell you more about meditation than I can, who are here today. And I think it's very not that you not only be, have meditation, but you, that you really carry it on to, to become a co contemplation, and that you develop a contemplative life. 
so that you are really carrying this with you throughout the day while you're driving your car, while you're doing whatever it is, while you're washing the dishes. You know, Thich Nhat Hanh says there's two ways to wash dishes. You know, one is to get them clean and the other way is to wash dishes. You know, you just wash dishes to wash dishes. You know, there's, there's, the hands have their own, it's a hand meditation, right? Hand, and I think it's very important you have hand meditations too if you do. Ram Das was one telling a story about uh, a, a psychedelic experience he had to an audience. There was an older woman in the front row who just kept nodding and nodding and nodding like she understood everything we said. He was talking about patterns and nets and dimensions and stuff. And during the break, he walked over to this woman and said, You seem to understand everything I say. And she said, Yes, I crochet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> got the pattern, you know, they got the meditation, you know, just let it go. You know, this is, this is further down on this list here, but I further that and the, one of the things that's on the list is creative acts, being involved in whatever creative acts it is for you, is a way of, of introducing you to the mystical dimension. So there's, and I really think it's, have some creative thing that you can do, whether it's gardening or crocheting or knitting or whatever. I'll talk more about some of these things a little bit later. All right, so con developing a contemplative life. John Lilling called driving the American mode of meditation. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you, it could be. I, I go into New York City some evenings to teach, and then I drive home later at night. I don't even turn the radio on in the car, just the sound of the pavement of the wheels. and blah, 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 blah. You know, you meditate your way home, and the next thing you know, you're home. And you know, how did that happen? You know, and you're very aware. You have awareness. awareness is very, very high. You're not, not losing awareness. In fact, it's higher awareness because you're paying attention, but you're not upset about it. Okay, number one, crash and burn, don't do. Number two, meditation, do, do. Number three, the major stimulant is nature. Being alone, especially in nature. Now, I'm going to add another component here, and that is mystical experiences usually occur when you're alone. Now, there's an exception to that, which I'll talk about in a minute, but they usually occur when one is alone. And therefore, I might add that one of the ways that people come to have mystical experiences is while they're engaged in solo sports. Not competitive sports, because competitive sports involve the ego. The runner's high, walking, skiing, sailing, surfing, hang gliding, gliding, whatever it is, but something that you do out in nature. And the very fact that you're out in nature means that you are more <laughs> susceptible to seeing the connection of all things, the connection of all life. And many of our mystics, of course, we know our great nature mystics, like St. Francis of Assisi. Everything is brother-sister. You know, the, the, the movie of his life, Brother, Son, Sister, Moon, right? But just being in nature. Thoreau says, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to confront the essential of life, and not find when it came time to die that I hadn't lived. Right? Number four is music. Nietzsche once said, without music, life would be a mistake. <laughs> it would, wouldn't it? <laughs> How tragic this would be if we didn't have music. Pythagoras is the first person to figure out that music was mathematical, right? that there was number and ratio in music, that there was such a thing as a half note and a whole note and a quarter note. Right? And when he figured that out, he saw it as divine revelation. And he was so inspired, he was the first person that ever figured out that music was math, and math was music. After Pythagoras, you could write music. Before Pythagoras, you couldn't write music, right? He was so thrilled by it that he offered up 40 oxen to the muses in appreciation for this divine revelation that had been given to him. I was once listening to the Polonaise, and just sitting alone in my room, I just burst into tears, and I thought, well, where did that come from? I mean, there are, on, there are no words <laughs> in the Polonaise, right? I want to read you a description of a mystical experience of happening listening to, to music. 
This is from Samuel Pepys' diary. Anybody ever read Samuel Pepys' diary? This is an incredible diary. It's from the 1660s in England. He wrote this diary assuming nobody would ever read it. Well, you wrote a diary. Nobody's ever going to read it. The fact is that it was even found and published. And this is still available to Barnes and Nobles, too. The 27th, up. Every day begins with up. And with wife and Deb to the king's house to see the virgin martyr, that which did please me beyond everything in the whole world was the wind music. When the angel comes down, which is so sweet that it did ravish me, and in a deed did wrap up my soul that is so did it make me really sick, just as I have formerly been when I fell in love with my wife. But neither then nor all the evening going home, and at home was I able to think of anything but remained all night transported so that I could not believe that ever any music have this real command over a soul of a man, as this did upon me. So this is a mystical experience that came from listening to music. And let me add at this point that I said most mystical experiences tend to happen when you're alone. I was once teaching a course in the history of mysticism, and I had the students read a bunch of stuff. And I, I asked them, what do you notice the similarities about these mystics? And one boy raised his hand and says, none of them were married. <laughs> 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 That's not quite true. There were a number of married mystics who really enjoyed being married, like um, William Blake, for example, loved marriage. Right? So um, mystical experiences will also occur in groups. But there's condition around it occurring in a group. And the condition is, number one, well, I might add that the next category on here is worship. I'm going to mix, mix worship in now a little bit. With, when I say worship, I mean, I'm sorry about all you guys out there who are preachers, but it's not listening to the preacher preach. But it's around music chanting the kirtans in the Eastern traditions, you know, or singing, whether it's a black Baptist swinging and swaying together, or it's the Gorian chants of the uh, Trappist monks. I have a friend who was a Trappist monk for a long time, and then he dropped out and became a psychologist, but he tells a story about he'd been doing chanting for four hours, they, they, from two 15 in the morning to 6.15 in the morning, right? They go to bed at 7. <laughs> so he's been doing this, like the Grinch, for four hours. And now he's out walking on the monastery grounds, and he's got one of those hoods on. It kind of comes up around, so it blocks off the light. And the only thing you can see is just straight ahead, right? And he's in this really altered state. I mean, you've been four hours of chanting, right? He said... He looked down, he said, it's very peaceful. All of a sudden, all the grass was filled with light. He looked up and there was a tree all filled with light, and there was a barn all filled with light. And it says, every, in this moment, everything communicated with him. What it says was, we're happy. Just being grass and just being a tree. Just being. Just being's incredible. Do you ever think about what the alternative is? There isn't one. <laughs> all right? Just being. When you're really awake and you know, you're, you're just being, that's, that's, that's an incredible thing, just being. Right? So, um, I'll tell you about a couple of uh, group mystical experiences surrounding music. I was giving a talk out in Santa Anita, which is near Hollywood, and after it, a guy came up to me and he said, you know, I play in a symphony orchestra in Hollywood. He says, there's this most wonderful thing that sometimes happens when you're playing in a symphony orchestra. Anybody here play in an orchestra? Now, keep in mind, we have certain elements here. Nobody can talk. That's very important. Okay. Nobody can talk. And he says, when everybody's on note and everybody's in tune, and everybody knows that everybody else is on note and in tune, and it's working perfect, the audience knows it's perfect. The conductor knows this is perfect. Musicians all know this is perfect. So you get these wonderful goosebump moments that just go up all over your whole body. He says, right? And this incredible high. This is a shared communal experience around music. Nobody's projecting in the sense of talking. And he said, you get these sudden standing ovations, and everybody, the philharmonic, the love of music that fills everybody's souls at that point, right? That's worship. 
And a lady told me about an experience that's very similar to this. She said she was leader of a dance troupe. It had the same elements, the orchestra, the audience, the conductor, and there's a dance troupe up on stage. And the dancers are all on point. I mean, they are exactly where they were supposed to be. They're doing exactly what they're supposed to, right? And they get to the end of the piece. And one of the dancers says, so that nobody else could hear, just the other dancers, did you feel that? Did you feel that? <laughs> right? So it can happen in group experiences, but keep in mind that nobody's being projective and then it's got to be a kind of thing where it's like a chanting sort of situation, right? So I'm running low on time. Just to mention, I'll just mention a couple more and then we'll stop. I don't have time to go in and do this. Some, these are all in my book, uh, what is most of the list and analysis of some of us. Some of these, of the 21 on the list of stimulants, the four or five of them look very negative. Um, I might add that they're not negative. I mean, they're, they are negative, but, well, they, here's what they are. The death of somebody really close to you especially the sudden, unexpected death of someone you love, brings the world to a grinding halt. What has to happen, the world has got to stop to have these, right? The world stops. Stop making up the world. I remember once getting a phone call about the death of a friend that happened quite suddenly and just turning my desk chair around and sitting and looking out at the woods for a couple of hours. How, how was I going to just keep working? Just keep paying bills? I don't think so. Right? Uh, the prospect of your own death I don't have time to go into this at all, but I had cancer in 2001. I had a tumor removed from my insides, the side of the lemon, they said. And then uh, the day after, I had an experience you never want to have, which was I woke up in the hospital room to see the oncologist standing at the foot of my bed. And his first words were, Mr. Mundy, I have to tell you the cancer spread. So they gone into my lymph system. The next morning, at 4 o'clock in the morning, by the way, mystical experiences very often happen around 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. Right? Why? You're alone. It's dark. There's no external stimulants. Your mind is rested. And now it's awake. You're much more receptive. You're much more likely to be receiving at that point than when you're busy. Right? I don't have time to go into it, but I had a profound mystical experience. It's in uh, my book, Missouri Mystic. In fact, can I brag for just a brag? I don't know what this brag is. i just share this with you. This is just a really, somebody came up to me this last week and told me that a friend of hers had died with my book in her hand on that chapter. It's called, a classroom called Cancer. Right? It's about a death experience that happened around cancer, right? So um, those are some of the negatives, like the prospect of your own death or the death of somebody that's, or the loss of a, the break of a, of a relationship as well, uh, a collapse of a relationship for whatever reason is also on there. The other one that's on there I can talk is, is I could go in a lot more detail about the creative dimension. Essentially I see four and I'll, I'll tell you these four and then I'll stop and we'll have a few minutes of questions. One crash and burn, don't do. Two meditation, do do. Three, it just seems to happen. I call this relaxation. For some reason, you get really relaxed, and it happens because you got really relaxed, whether that was because you were enjoying a solo sport or playing a musical instrument or whatever you were doing, just laying down on the couch on a Sunday afternoon, and all of a sudden, it just, slip. it just slips, right? And the fourth way, which I don't have time, I will not go into, but if I had time, we would go into. You could spend the whole day on the fourth one, and that's what I call the way of work working on ourselves, deliberately doing something to change the way we see things. Gary Jevon Spencer called their path the work. 